Hello and welcome to lecture number four. Uh, trade, factor availability, and factor proportions are key. This is from chapter four of your book. Uh, hopefully prior to watching this lecture, you've already read the chapter. Um, there's no substitute for reading in this particular class. And so it is uh, an important part of your preparation for your quizzes and exams. Um, so in chapter three, we discussed um, some theories about um, absolute um, or co comparative advantage. Uh, we ended up talking about um, a theory um, by Ricardo, and uh, we're going to talk about some um, some slight variations to that um, that that make uh, it a little bit more realistic in, in the real world. So let's let's jump into that. Um, we're we're going to try and answer four fundamental questions about trade. The first is what is the basis for trade? Second, what are the gains from trade? Third, what are the effects of trade on production and consumption in each country? And what are the distributional effects of trade in each nation? So first, we're going to talk about production with increasing marginal costs. And this is one of the differences um, as we uh, look at the modern theory uh, of international trade. You'll remember with the Ricardian approach from chapter three, um, we had the production possibility curve, which um, was uh, a flat line, um, um, which meant that um, there was no increasing uh, marginal opportunity costs. It was a constant marginal opportunity cost. And so we'll talk about um, this from an increasing marginal cost perspective. Uh, as one industry expands at the expense of others, increasing amounts of the other products must be given up to get each extra unit of the expanding industry's product. So um, in uh, lecture three, we saw the production possibility curve, which was just how much of wheat and how much of cloth was going to be produced. And um, it was a, a flat line. So as um, one unit of wheat was not produced, uh, one unit of cloth was produced. Um, but that's not always the case in the real world. Um, sometimes there's an increasing marginal cost, which we'll look at a graph that will illustrate that more fully. So it's not always a one-for-one -one, um, uh, replacement as we look at the production possibility curve. So a, um, a, productions, a country's production possibility curve shows the combination of amounts of different products that a country can produce given the country's available factor resources and maximum feasible productivities. So now let's look at the, the production possibility curve in a more realistic way. So you'll remember from uh, lecture three, this was not curved, um, it was a straight line. So um, we have uh, wheat production, this is billion, billions of units per year, and this is cloth production in billions of units per year. So with a straight line, let's, um, let's assume it was this line where uh, the slope was one. So for each unit of wheat that um, we, we didn't produce, we could then produce an additional unit of cloth. And so the slope of that line was one um, which was one unit of wheat for one unit of cloth. Well, in the real world, um, as we uh, try to increase production in a particular product and start taking away uh, resources from uh, this other product that we would produce, um, the costs of producing cloth um, start to increase. And um, uh, we can see this down here be below in, in this lower graph, um, which shows rising opportunity costs for producing cloth in the US. So you can see at uh, 20 billion units, um, the, the cost is one unit of wheat. But as we increase and start producing 40 billions of units, uh, billion units, uh, we can see that the cost of an extra cloth unit is now two units of wheat. Uh, and if we go out even further to 60 billion units, we can see it costs three 
um, units of wheat. So this is the supply curve for cloth in the United States. Um, and you can see that the more units we, we produce, the more costly it is in terms of wheat uh, to produce it. And so you can see that's where our, our slope changes and, and where the, this curve gets its shape. So here at 20 billion units, our slope is just one, one uh, unit of wheat per one unit of cloth. Um, here, the slope uh, doubles um, at two. So it's two units of wheat per cloth. And then here, the slope is at a three, three units of, of wheat per cloth. So this is our production possibility curve under increasing costs, which is much more realistic um, as we look at um, allocating resources across uh, industries. So what's behind the bowed out production possibility curve? When I say bowed out, I mean, um, it's actually curved, it's bowed out instead of being a straight line uh, as we saw in, in the last lecture. So why are increasing costs curve bowed out in shape? more realistic than constant or straight line production possibility curves. And we talked a little bit about that as I looked at the graphs. Uh, uh, it's important to note that a country's production possibility curve is derived from information on both total factor or resource supplies and the production functions that indicate how factor inputs can be used to produce outputs in various industries. So the explanation for the realism of increasing costs and that boat out shape, first, there are several kinds of factor inputs, land, skilled labor, unskilled labor, capital, et cetera. Different products use factor inputs in different proportions. I was um, a CFO for uh, an electrical contracting firm. We did <clears throat> uh, university buildings, hospitals, um, prisons, large commercial projects um, all over. And um, when uh, there was a lot going on in the construction industry, a lot of building, um, what would happen to the inputs as uh, more and more things were being built? Well, uh, let's look at skilled labor. Uh, an electrician, there are only so many electricians. And in order to get more people to, um, to work as electricians, you have to in, end up offering higher and higher wages. So the cost of production um, uh, goes up the more and more uh, you're trying to produce. So um, that production possibility curve is certainly bowed out. So what production combination is actually chosen? Um, it depends on the price ratio that competitive firms face. Let's suppose that the market price of cloth in terms of wheat is two wheat per cloth. So one unit of cloth costs us two wheat. If you are a competitive firm vying with other firms around you, you'll see one of these three conditions at any production point. So let's go to the next slide. If the opportunity cost of producing another unit of cloth is less than two wheat per cloth that you can sell it for, then you'll try to make more cloth and take resources away from wheat. The opportunity cost is less because the slope of the PPC is flatter at that point than two wheat per, per one unit of cloth. And so if the opportunity cost is less, then we'll certainly take resources away from wheat and put it towards producing uh, cloth. What if it's more than the two wheat per cloth uh, that you can sell it for? Then you'll try to make less cloth and you're going to shift resources into uh, growing more wheat. The opportunity cost is greater and the slope of the PPC is steeper than two wheat per cloth. So if you go back to um, the curve that we had here, um, you can see this illustrates exactly what we're talking about. So if it's, if it's less than one, um, or sorry, less than the two, then we're gonna want to add um, uh, more cloth. It's gonna cost us less um, to make more cloth. Um, uh, and if it's up here, we're gonna make less cloth uh, 
uh, because the cost uh, is much higher and we'll start to make more wheat. So going back to that, um, what if it's equal um, to the two wheat per cloth that we can sell it for? Um, there's no reason to shift any production at that point. We're at uh, uh, an equilibrium point, a point. Um, and so we'll continue to produce the amounts that we currently are producing. Next, we're gonna talk about another concept called the community indifference curve. Community indifference curve. So an indifference curve shows the various combinations of consumption quantities that lead to the same level of well-being or happiness, uh, which in economics we call utility, the same level of utility. So up to this point, we've been looking at the production possibility curve. So that's production. We're on the supply of uh, or producing these products. Now we're uh, shifting and talking about consumption, um, the consumption quantities that lead to the same level of well-being uh, or happiness. So people can choose between consuming cloth or wheat and certain levels of each will bring certain levels of happiness or well-being or utility to um, individuals. A community indifference curve um, purport to show how the economic well-being of a whole group depends on the whole group's consumption of products. Uh, this is uh, very difficult to measure. It's, it's uh, very difficult to add up um, individual ind uh, indifference curves to come up with some um, uh, group community indifference curve. We'll talk about this a little bit more. Now let's look at um, indifference curves relating to an individual's level of well-being to consumption of two goods. So again, we've got wheat being consumed and cloth being consumed. Let's look at uh, this first line, I0. So um, this indifference curve I0 shows that the individual well-being or happiness um, uh, it shows the individual well-being or happiness for a, an individual at, at this point. And points A, B, and C um, make an individual equally happy. So they're indifferent. So they could be consuming this much wheat and this much cloth, and it would make them as happy as um, uh, consuming this much wheat and this much cloth. So here's a 40 and 40. Um, up here it's 80 and 20, down here it's 20 and 80. Okay, so, so along this curve, um, you can see that they are indifferent. Uh, it doesn't matter the combination as long as it's somewhere along this, this curve. Um, however, um, if we look at uh, this curve I1, uh, you can see that uh, point D is better um, than any of these points and will bring them more happiness. Um, and uh, you can see at point E, uh, which there's not a dot there, but point E on I2 is even more preferred. So it's, this is worse. So if it's, if the production or sorry, consumption is somewhere uh, to the left and, and below the curve, then that uh, brings less happiness. Uh, if we move this direction, that is better for, um, for the individual consuming. So some um, thoughts on indifferent curves. Indifference curves are individual uh, and specific to that individual. Um, so uh, what one uh, consumer prefers over another will be different. Um, and difference curves are downward sloping, as we saw in the last um, figure. They're concave to the origin, uh, and there are an infinite uh, number of indifference curves. We call this the indifference map. Um, and indifference curves cannot intersect. So here are some, some thoughts on indifference curves. Um, again, they're individual and specific to that individual. So what about community indifference curves? Community indifference curves are useful. Um, however, economic theory raises difficult questions about community indifference curves. The shape of individual indifference curves uh, differ from person to person. Uh, 
So there's, there's no clear way to add up individuals in difference curves to obtain a community in difference curve. The concept of national well-being or welfare is not clearly, not clearly defined. So now we're going to put production and consumption together. So we've got our production possibility curve plus our um, uh, indifference curves. And we're going to look at it uh, first uh, without trade and then with trade. Without trade, the US must be self-sufficient and find the combination of domestically produced wheat and cloth that will maximize community well-being. With trade, however, the U.S. imports cloth from the rest of the world and exports wheat to the rest of the world. Now let's look at indifference curves and production possibility curves without trade. So point S0 is the no trade equilibrium for the United States. Um, if instead the United States found itself at any point on the U.S. production possibility curve, consumers or producers would want to shift towards S0. So this is where the highest level of happiness or well-being is reached along the production possibility curve. So to see this, consider uh, this example in which the economy begins at S1 with a price ratio set by the slope of the production possibility curve. So here's the price ratio. Um, so that would probably be one wheat per one cloth, one unit of wheat per one unit of cloth. Consumers would find that this makes cloth look so cheap that they'd rather buy more than 20 billion units that they're current, currently buying and less than 80 billion units of wheat. So producers will follow this change in demand along this curve and shift resources in the cloth production and out of wheat. So the tendency um, to alter production will persist until the economy produces and consumes at the equilibrium point of S0. So now we'll move to looking at uh, opening up international trade. And uh, you'll see figure 4.4 um, shows the U.S. economy um, on the left-hand side and the rest of the world on the right-hand side. And uh, so we're looking at um, first the no trade equilibrium at point S0. You can see the no trade equilibrium. So this is prior to opening international trade. So this is um, where the production and consumption would meet. And we can see that down below, this, these are the supply and demand curves. Uh, we would settle in at point A for our supply and demand uh, domestically. Um, similar here, we find an equilibrium at S0. The supply and demand curve here uh, for cloth would end up at this point for the rest of the world. So what happens when we open up international trade? Well. Um, as we've seen before, um, the uh, US and the rest of the world, when we looked at our example of motorbikes in an earlier lecture, um, there's an advantage um, based on a comparative advantage to um, uh, each country uh, trading uh, some of their products. And so what we end up with is an equilibrium uh, up bef before um, before we do international trade, we can see the cost of one unit of cloth is two units of wheat in the U.S. Um, in uh, the rest of the world, it was 0.67 units of wheat per cloth. Once we open up trade, the new equilibrium um, price would be one uh, unit of wheat per one unit of cloth, and that's the same. Uh, as we look at S1 here, we can see that slope, that tangent line is one unit of wheat uh, per cloth. So we have a new world price. And given that new price, we can see an increase in demand for cloth in the United States. And so you can see here 
the consumption, um, we could consume, if we take this tangent line at S1, we, the, the United States would consume there wherever um, the indifference curve uh, hits this tangent line. And so whichever point is on the farthest right indifference curve, uh, that's where we consume consume. And so this point, C1, now gives the U.S. Uh, the most amount of well-being or utility. We have a similar effect here in uh, the rest of the world. We've got our new equilibrium point at S1, which gives us our new tangent line right here. And as we go through this tangent line and we find the, um, uh, the indifference curve that touches that tangent line at the farthest point to the right, we can see that's C1. And so um, that will coincide with the amount uh, demanded. You can see now this um, consumption equates to the uh, number demanded. Okay, so, but at this price, this is the amount that would be supplied in the US. So th the difference between this point and point B would be the amount of cloth that is imported. And you can see the same here. As the price rises in the rest of the world, we can see the demand decreases, but the supply will increase, and the difference between the two is exported to the US. And so you can see the uh, utility or well being of both the US and the rest of the world both increase significantly beyond where they were uh, before no trade. So, a look at gains from trade. Trade allows both countries to reach a higher level of economic well being than before traded. A country's um, gain depends on the price ratios before trade, the autarky price, and after, uh, after the trade. Trade affects both production and consumption patterns in both countries. So let's look at trade effects on production. Uh, the opening up of trade has two types of implications for production. And remember, we're looking at the production possibility curve. Within each country, output expands for the product in which the country has a comparative advantage. So in the US, it was wheat. In the rest of the world, it was cloth. The expanding industry or the export sector acquires factor resources from other industries. So those wheat producers would start to uh, acquire um, factor resources from the US cloth producers. Um, the, imp the import competing sector reduces its domestic production. So we see cloth production shrinking in the US in this example, while wheat production is growing. Second, the shift from autarky to free trade results in more efficient world production as each country expands output of the product in which it is initially the lower cost producer. So um, this shift makes the world more efficient in their production. The US produces more wheat, the rest of the world produces more cloth, and combined the world is more effective and efficient. So uh, we need to now discuss the concept of substitution effect. In each country, the relative price of the importable product declines, so consumers tend to buy more of the importable product and less of the exportable product. And so uh, with the US, as they do international trade, the cost of cloth declines. So consumers will tend to buy more of that importable product, more cloth, and start to buy less of the exportable product or wheat. So what is the real income effect? In each country, real incomes rise. So consumers have more buying power and tend to buy more of both products. And so because of the benefits that come to both countries, consumers have more buying power and can purchase more products. What about trade effects on consumption? So opening up of trade alters the quantities consumed of each 
product. In each country, the quantity consumed of the importable product will increase. So in the US, they will start to consume more cloth. And in the rest of the world, they'll start to consume more wheat. In each country, the quantity consumed of the exportable product can decrease, stay the same, or increase. And that depends on the sizes of the negative substitution effect and the positive income effect. So as we saw with substitution um, uh, in the US, for instance, they'll start to buy more cloth uh, than wheat. However, because of increased incomes, uh, they'll start to buy more of both. And so it really depends on um, uh, the sizes of these effects, uh, whether or not uh, the quantity consumed of the exportable product will decrease, stay the same or increase. So in the US, um, wheat is the exportable product. So will the consumption of the exportable product decrease, stay the same or increase? And we won't know until we can see um, the size of each of these effects. So what determines the trade pattern? The immediate basis for the pattern of international trade is that the relative product prices differ between the two countries. So uh, two wheat per cloth in the US versus 0.67 units of wheat per cloth um, internationally or the rest of the world. So the immediate basis for the pattern of international trade is um, that the relative product prices differ between the two countries if there were no trade. But why do product prices differ? A possible cause for relative price differences are production condi conditions can differ, supply side factors. Um, producing wheat, maybe um, the land in the US is just better for producing wheat uh, or other supply side factors may uh, feed into that. Demand conditions can differ also. So some combination of these factors may cause price differences um, when we're looking at supply and demand side factors. Next, we'll look at the hecksher olin theory of trade. And this theory predicts, and we call it the HO theory, this predict, uh, predicts that a country exports product or products that uses its relatively abundant factors intensively and imports the product or products that uses its relatively scarce factors intensively. So what does that mean? Um, a country is relatively labor abundant if it has a higher ratio of labor to other factors than does the rest of the world. And we can see that in some countries, they have uh, their labor abundant. A product is relatively labor intensive if labor costs are a greater share of its value than they are of the value of other products. So the HO comparative advantage is actually a triple comparison. So we look at comparative advantage across countries, across products, and across factors of production. So before we were only looking at countries and products, now we're looking at factors of production, such as labor. So what is the setting for the HO theory for trade? There are two factors of production, labor and land. Factors of production can freely move between industries in a country. So we're uh, assuming perfect factor mobility within the country. The owners of land are paid rent, are and the reward to workers is wage rate W. So uh, moving onward on the HO model, countries differ in their relative endowment of factors of production. In our example, the US is assumed to be relatively land abundant, while the rest of the world is assumed to be relatively labor abundant. So this implies that if we look at land over labor, land is greater for the US than land over labor for the rest of the world. Alternatively, alternatively, we can look at rent over wages. So rent, cost of rent for the land um, would be less than the wages in the US. And so 
um, this is less than the rent for land versus wages in the rest of the world. Um, so the rest of the world didn't have as much land, but had um, cheap labor, relatively abundant labor. And so that makes uh, these relationships um, uh, able to, to understand that. So uh, production technologies used to produce goods are identical across countries in their model. Obviously, we know that's not true in real life, but this will help us to understand the model. In this example, we assume that in both countries, the production of wheat is more land intensive than the production of cloth, so that um, the technologies that go into producing wheat, land over labor, uh, is greater than land over labor for cloth. Identi identical com demand conditions um, we assume consumers' tastes are the same across countries, which we know is not true in real life, but this helps us set up the model. So that um, is a summary of the HO model. Again, I recommend reading the book um, to get a, a, a deeper understanding of it, um, but I, I hope this uh, has been a helpful lecture. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me or call me uh, during my office hours, or if those hours are not good for you, uh, I'm happy to set up another time to, to chat.